and welcome to Railway Mania. This is a new podcast and the aim is to give you bite-sized snippets of everything to do with railways. Sometimes it's a short history lesson, sometimes a discussion about a particular person or subject. Whatever your interest is in railways, I hope that it entertains and it gives you something to think about. Today, we're going to be diving headfirst into history and talking about the real railway mania. This was the name for an economic frenzy in the 1840s, when it seemed as if railways were out of control even before they were being built. How? Why? What happened to it? Well, keep listening and I'll do my best to explain. Firstly, some context. Railway building in England got off to something of a shaky start. Whilst tramways and wagonways were commonplace, steam haulage was an unproven technology. George Stevenson's Locomotion No. 1 hauled passengers on the Stockton and Darlington in 1825, but the railway continued to use horsepower alongside steam. The Liverpool and Manchester, opened in 1830, was the first railway in the modern sense. Double-tracked and designed for locomotive haulage from the start, linking two large cities, this set the standard and captured the hearts and minds of investors and entrepreneurs. Railway development in Britain has always been closely tied to the economy. Crucially, in 1825, the British government repealed the Bubble Act. While the Bubble Act sounds like the best kid's birthday party entertainer ever, bubbles, in this sense, refer to the outlandish and almost nonsensical companies founded in the 1720s to rip off hapless investors. These companies were mostly typical snake oil salesmen. The purpose of one of them is recorded officially as being for carrying on an undertaking of great advantage, but nobody to know what it is which sounds like an email you might find in your junk folder. Turns out people in the past were just at risk of being duped by these scams as they are today. So limiting these crooks was a good thing, right? Well, yes, but in the early 19th century, the government was trying to get to grips with a booming industrial revolution. The pace of technological change was outgrowing an economy designed around the age of sale. Railways needed money, and lots of it. Building the Liverpool and Manchester alone cost over £55 million in today's money. Now, if you're a bit of an economic numpty like I am, this might all be a bit bewildering, so I will do my best to keep it simple. The Bubble Act had limited joint stock companies to a maximum of five separate investors, so companies, and railway companies in particular, were forced to seek funding from a very small pool of wealthy people. These would usually be banks, aristocrats, or industrialists. A little side note here, the Stockton and Darlington Railway was largely funded by Quakers. The Pease family were among these amazing industrial dynasties, and like all dynasties, they only seem to use five first names, so it's hard to keep track of who's who. Edward Pease, born in 1767, is sometimes called the father of the railways. He was not only the main promoter of the Stockton and Darlington, he also invested in George Stevenson's new locomotive building company in 1823. Without the finance of these shrewd business owners turned investors, the Industrial Revolution might have stalled at the first hurdle. The repeal of the Bubble Act not only allowed the general public to buy shares, it also opened the doors to relentless self-promotion from these new companies. The effects of this took a while to bear fruit. Reliability of steam power was not the only reason for the railway's shaky start. There was a large resistance to this new iron road that cut the countryside in half. Aristocrats seemed to either welcome and promote the railway, or absolutely hate it, particularly if a route was planned to cross their land. There was a great deal of social unrest at the time, as the old way of doing things was being pushed aside to make way for the Industrial Revolution. Coupled with this, interest rates were high and rose further, meaning that investing your hard-earned cash in a railway was not as profitable as having some government bonds. Now, this doesn't mean that no railways were being proposed or built at all, Many new lines opened, and railway promoters started to get into their stride. Every railway proposal required an Act of Parliament to be approved. Here's the thing though, this was all new tech, and no one had any experience of how to deal with it, least of all the government. The attitude those in power took during this period was, whatever, as long as you think it'll work, just show us where. This meant that, whilst the route had to be approved, there was no legal reason to check if there was any point in building the new railway. The promoters didn't have to supply any hard evidence or even a business case that the railway would make money. And what's more, there were no limits on the number of companies. Two separate companies could bid to build railways between the same two locations on different routes, and both had equal chance of getting a bill. I wonder, had this been more tightly regulated, would Dr Beeching have been out of a job over 100 years later? <laughs> 
Possibly the greatest example of a railway promoter of this period was a man by the name of George Hudson. Known as the Railway King, he really deserves an episode all to himself. I can't help but like the character of Hudson. He's totally a crook and a fraudster, but there's an apparent cheekiness to him, almost like Del Boy or Loki from the Avengers if you want a reference from this century. Hudson promoted multiple railways, was an MP, and got himself put on the board of many lines, which were sometimes at odds with each other. He also completely fudged the numbers on his bookkeeping, amongst other things, paying dividends out of the capital rather than the revenue accounts. This might sound familiar. If you've ever seen the episode of The Simpsons where Springfield gets duped into building a useless and dangerous monorail, the character that convinces everybody that this is a good idea is almost a caricature of a railway promoter during the railway mania. Energetic and charming, he glosses over the safety and cost implications with a catchy tune, although there is no historical evidence to suggest that George Hudson sang to a crowd of potential investors, but I sometimes like to imagine it. Mm. As the 1840s rolled around, the Bank of England cut interest rates. Side note, I still don't really know what this means, but the outcome matters more than the method for this story, so just go with it. This was an effort to stimulate the economy, and it worked. Manufacturing boomed, and so did the need to transport goods quickly. Over the course of a few years, there was an explosion in the number of railways being promoted. More and more people used their newfound wealth to invest. It seemed like such a low-risk option. How could they not make money from this new miracle of the age? The optimism was contagious, and the promoters fanned the flames for as much money as they could get. However, just as in the previous century, not all of these schemes were totally honest. In the mix of investment opportunities were railways with a good reason to exist, for example connecting two large towns, or an inland city to a port. Some were not so great, particularly an obsession with direct routes, which in an effort to avoid large obstacles, such as houses and buildings, avoided most of the towns along their route, and connected obscure locations for no apparent purpose, whilst at the same time bypassing anybody that might have actually used the railway. Some lines proposed were duplicates of others. Some were just railways that had no intention of existing at all, and were fraudulent schemes for the sole purpose of getting money out of investors and walking off with it. The problem was, how could someone not used to investing tell the schemes apart? These people were not business-hardened Quakers. There were no telecoms or internet to fact-check these schemes, no ability to look up the promoters on LinkedIn. Whilst the government did reject schemes that were clearly ludicrous or fraudulent, many members of parliament were themselves investors, so bills were being granted on the basis of self-interest. Shares could be purchased for a 10% deposit, but the railway company was able to call in the remainder at any time. Many people invested their life savings into these endeavours, buying large numbers of shares whilst only being able to afford the deposit. Now this is the important bit. Much like today's economy built around credit, to the railways, having cash in the bank was not as important as having the secure promise of more money to come. For the investors, it seemed like railways were such a surefire return on their money that they'd be able to pay the remaining amount using the return paid on the credited shares. How did this all end? Well, the Bank of England put interest rates back up in 1845. Higher interest rates meant that bonds were once again a more attractive prospect for making more money out of your money, so people started investing in that instead of the railways. At the same time, a lot of these new companies were now operating, and it started to become clear how pointless or over-optimistic some of them had been. Share prices in railways stopped their climb, levelled out, and then began to fall. Because of the drop in share prices, people suddenly stopped investing altogether. This meant that loads of companies suddenly had their funding pulled with no prospect of further finance. As such, they called in the remaining payments on their shares, which the investors couldn't afford. If you remember, they could only afford the 10% deposit. So many people lost all their money and were financially ruined. Around one third of the railways approved by Parliament were never built, but the sheer amount of lines that were proposed meant that even the remaining two thirds resulted in a huge amount of track all over Britain. Over 6,000 miles were built as a result of projects authorised between 1844 and 1846 alone. Around the mid-1840s, there were hundreds of small railway companies operating or building their own little lines. As the mania started to collapse, bigger companies started to buy up many of these smaller lines for rock-bottom prices. They were able to get these bargains because the shareholders faced the choice of losing all their money or getting a below-value offer for their shares. As an example, between 1843 and 1847, six separate railway companies merged together to form the York, Newcastle and Berwick Railway. You may not have heard of this railway before, that's because it in turn only lasted eight years, when it merged with three other companies to form the North Eastern Railway. 
An image forms in my mind of the painters working on repainting the trains into the new railway's colours, but before they can finish, another group of painters has started at the other end of the train as the livery has changed again. What were the effects of the crash? Well, the financial ruin of thousands of people was a terrible event. There was a positive effect though, which was the huge amount of railway lines constructed. A lot of these routes, which stood no chance of financial success on their own, when they were absorbed into larger companies and when operated as an integrated network, started to make money. The big players of the Victorian era were formed, and thanks to the unwilling sacrifice of the early investors, railways like the Great Western and the Midland got large empires for comparatively little money, compared to what it would have been if they'd had to do the fundraising themselves. That's probably not much of a help to the people who lost their life savings, but following generations benefited greatly. The crash of the railway mania did undermine public confidence in the railways, and it set the stage for more problems to come, including the monopolies exerted by the new empires of the large companies. However, the explosion in railway building helped spur on technological development, and for a long time, British railways were the most advanced in the world. I hope you enjoyed listening to the first episode of Railway Mania. These are early days for me, and it was quite a big subject to get my head around. I'm aiming for these shows to appeal to anyone who is interested in railways at different knowledge levels. Sometimes this will mean assuming a certain amount of knowledge, so it may be hard for some listeners to keep up, and sometimes it will mean that some listeners know far more than I do, and I'll be repeating basic information. Overall, I hope it strikes a balance that's entertaining. Please take a look at railwaymania.net for more episodes, and there's a form on there to send me an email if you have any comments, suggestions, or if you want to correct some glaringly obvious mistakes I've made. Railway Mania is also on Facebook, and the Twitter handle is at railwaymaniannet. Thank you for listening. Thank you.